It was spontaneous combustion for me. I had such a fear around the age of about eight that I was just going to spontaneously combust. <laughs> I don't know why. Hello and welcome to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft and in this episode we're going to be going back to childhood as we celebrate the three books that have won at this year's Waterstones Children's Book Prize. Later on we'll speak to Shana Jackson, winner of the Younger Readers category with her urban detective thriller High Rise Mystery, and Liz Hyder, winner of the Older Readers category with her dark fable Bear Mouth. Before that it's time to chat with Nathan Bryan and illustrator Dapo Adiola about their picture book Look Up, which not only won the illustrated books category but also scooped the overall winner's prize. We spoke about the message behind the book and the impact on young readers of seeing a character like Rocket on the shelves of a bookshop. Dapo and Nathan, uh, congratulations, first of all, uh, on winning the Waterstones Children's Book Prize. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a huge moment. It's a fantastic thing to celebrate. And I think one of the things that's been amazing to see, obviously, booksellers have been loving this book and they've been putting it in the hands of parents and of children. But what's been really interesting is to see children and I guess particularly you know young black British kids picking the book up off the shelf themselves because of course what they see is a reflection of themselves on that shelf not for the first time I think children's publishing is is more diverse perhaps than than sort of adult publishing but I wonder for you what it feels like to to know that kids are seeing that book and gravitating towards it because of what it means to them. That already is a beautiful thought and image in my head seeing a young black child running into Waterstones and taking Look Up off the shelf, that gives me so much joy and so much hope because that is exactly why we want to do this. This is why it's important to have black children on the covers of books as the protagonists. That's so important to um, Dapo and I. Absolutely. And Dapo, like you, you've shared on World Book Day this incredible thread of images, which was kids who had dressed up as Rocket. Now, of course, Rocket for you is something that you sat at a table and drew and illustrated and coloured and all the rest of it. But I wonder what it felt like to then see that character come, literally come to life with all of these kids choosing to dress up as, as Rocket as they headed off to school for World Book Day. That must have been incredible. Right. So I could literally take up the whole podcast telling you <laughs> about how that felt, but I'm not going to. What I'm going to try and do is summarise it. So as you as you said... I did sit, I laboured over Rocket for almost three years. I drew her, um, you know, in, in, a, in a couple of different forms before we reached, you know, the design that we have now. And while drawing her, um, I don't know, the thought wasn't, the, the thought wasn't a, a factor. You know, I wasn't trying to design this iconic character. I was just trying to design the character that summed up all the things that Nathan and I wanted her to sum up, basically. Mm. Um, and just to kind of see the way that she's gone on to connect with children all around the world, right? And and their parents as well. Because I get, you know, parents coming up to me saying, oh my God, I wish this character was around when I was younger. I wish that, you know, like she, she reminds me of myself when I was younger. There's a particular picture in the book of Rocket having her hair done by her mum, which mm. just connected. It speaks to generations of Black women, you know, globally. And then we get World Book Day and that happens and I'm a mess because I'm just in, you know, there are tears, there are literal tears coming out of my eyes seeing children walking around dressed up for World Book Day as Rocket, you know. And again, the, the constant thing that I get told from um, friends of mine when they're reading the book to their young daughters is, you know, their daughters point at Rocket and they're like, oh, she looks just like me. She looks just like me. She looks just like me. And there's this kind of joy that comes from that. And Honestly, that wasn't that wasn't like a, a, a driving factor when creating the character again. So to see that happen organically is just wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And then it's an absolute testament to the fact that representation does matter. Absolutely. Absolutely. You mentioned there like the, the parents who said that they wished that book existed when they were kids. Yeah. Um, and as you say, we, we're seeing things change. Representation is improving. It still, of course, has a long way to go. But Nathan, I wonder if I could come to you first, because I wonder when you were a kid, what were the books that you were reading? In fact, were you were you a reader um, or is it something you discovered later in life? You know, wh when did books become a big part of your life? And then, of course, the, the desire to write yourself. Um, I think, um, luckily, books have always been a big part of my life. 
um, and so have stories. So in and reading stories in loads of different forms, whether that be comic books, whether that be picture books. Um, my big books in my life were Roald Dahl. That was everything. Every story he's ever written, I could imagine and went in that world. Um, the Unfortunate Events book series was just like, oh my goodness. I've, it was incredible. It was like, I went on every journey. Like, even though I've been very privileged and had a lovely upbringing, reading those stories, it was just every page. You just couldn't believe what was happening. Um, so yeah, those those two series. But then, and of course, Anything by Mallory Blackman. That was like, any book she put out, Pig Heart Boy was just like, I cried reading that. And I was like, what, 10? I don't know, something like that. And of course, Noughts and Crosses. So yeah, books have always been huge. But actually, weirdly, as I've got older, when I got to an age probably when I was in my teens where I was way more excited by, you know, hanging around, doing stupid stuff <laughs> <laughs> and, not, and not reading. Whereas now as an adult, I'm way more, I, I buy books every week and I'm always reading uh, everything I can so yeah and how about you Dapo how, how how did books sort of play a part in your childhood so um books I mean I, I this is a stretch right it's a bit of a stretch but it's not too much of a stretch if I think about it logically I mean books gave me um an escape like that was that was the biggest part of I don't know my childhood my childhood was a bit tricky so books provided me with an escape from the things that were going on around me um mm. Oddly enough, I was I was I was classed as somebody who couldn't read by my guardian at the time because I was reluctant to do so. Um, I didn't actually start reading until I was seven, and it wasn't because I couldn't read; it was because of the ma the material that was being presented to me. It wasn't something I wanted to read. So it wasn't until I was about seven years old. I was in primary school, and the teacher at the time, Mrs. Coca, I will never forget her name. Um, she put me in front of the bookshelf. She was like, "Choose what you want." And that was the first time that I'd been given that freedom to actually choose what I wanted to read. And from that day till today, I haven't stopped reading. I, I, I'm an avid reader. Um, I first fell in love with the works of Roald Dahl, as most children my age at the time would do. Um, I loved the characters he created, the worlds he created, the kind of mischievousness of the stories and the absolute fantasy, um, fantastical fantasy elements of it like james and the giant peach you know it's it's a story about a kid that travels across the world in a giant peach with bugs right like it's so it, it it takes the normal and it just makes it just fantastical in such a crazy way and that's what i loved about his work um and it was a gateway to the works of c.s lewis um and the chronicles of narnia absolutely fell in love with his work as well um and that's when you know, around that time is when I realized that I'm I'm what's known as a collector of books. Like if I like something, the minute I like it, I collect everything to do with it. Like it's just so crazy. So um, it was Dahl, then C.S. Lewis, and then that was a gateway into the works of Brian Jacks um, and the Red Wall series, which was just amazing for me as well. These times I'm about 11 years old. Um, and then I, I, I found the works of David Gemmell, um, who's a, a brilliant fantasy author who's no longer with us, sadly, but he then became my absolute favourite author till this day. Like, his work is so amazing. So I'm this kid, I'm 11, I'm in the library taking out the works of um, C.S. Lewis, David Gemmell in secondary school. And at the time, I remember being the only kid who borrowed... Because, you know, libraries keep a timestamp of when the mm. last time the book was taken out. And our librarian, um, she was amazing. And she was shocked because she was like, this book hasn't been taken out for about six years. And you are the first person to take it out. So again, I, I took all the David Gemmell books out, read them all time and time again. And we came into the second year, year eight at the time, I was 12, and she'd ordered the, the newest batch just for me. So I read them all. For the five years I was in secondary school, that was my escape. David Gemmell's books, The Library, and various other fantasy books, Terry Pratchett as well. And when we finished secondary school, she actually gifted all the books to me because no one else took them out. So she was just <laughs> like, she was like, you know what? They're going to miss you when you're gone. So you might as well take them with you. And I still have them. I still have them till today. So yeah, that's, that's my reading journey. That is amazing. I mean, it's really interesting. You mentioned the Chronicles of Narnia there. And yeah. Um, back in a, my previous life, I was an actor and I was in 
the line the witch in the wardrobe with the RSC. Um, yeah. yeah, back in the day, back in the day. Um, <laughs> and do you know what? Before we did that show, the the writer Nicholas Wright, who had adapted them I- into a play, he gave a little speech, and he he sort of tried to put out the importance of what we were about to do. We were about to go out in front of an audience of kids, and he said some of those kids, this will be the first time they've ever been in the theatre. And so please make sure you do this show as well as you can. Make it the best possible experience for them that it can be. Because whether they come back to the theatre in the future kind of rests on your shoulders right now. Because if you give them the best night of their life, they will want to come back. They'll get the bug. They'll want to come back in the theatre again and again. Mm -hmm. And if you do a terrible show, you could just block it off for the rest of their lives. And I wondered whether when you, after that reading journey that you've been through, when you actually sit down to create yourself, um, whether there was a similar sense of responsibility, particularly with what we've spoken about with representation for you, Nathan, sitting down to write this book, did you feel a little bit like I've got to get this absolutely bang on because this will make a difference as to whether these kids continue to read for the rest of their lives or whether they just go, nah, not for me. See, um, I probably should have, but <laughs> <laughs> I think the pressure of creating is too great to put that on me. And also I um, knew it's my first book and like from, you know, from everything you learn about creating, you, you know, you, you have to be prepared to fail. So I put my everything into this book and I wanted it to be everything that hopefully it is becoming. But I was also prepared for it all to fall down, Penguin to fire me, no one to read it, (laughs) and just be like, well, I tried, you know. And it just so happened that, obviously, I didn't get fired. And, you know, we won the award. Whoa! But I I cannot, I I probably should do that more often, but I didn't know. Well, it sounds like it sounds like you had, you know, you were putting the pressure on yourself anyway, because as you say, you just wanted to get it absolutely right. This book. I mean, yeah. did it help to have somebody like Dapo to work together with creatively in in bringing this book together? Yeah, I mean, it'd be it'd be it, it just would it wouldn't I, there would be no look up without Dapo. There would be no rocket. There'd be no nothing. So, I think it's it's a thing where when he says it's our love child, it is true. This is natural. <laughs> <laughs> it is our creation. Something that sleepless nights have gone into um to create something we're hopefully what well, we are both extremely proud of so yeah yeah and dapo for you as a, as a creator as an illustrator you know did, did you feel a little bit of that sort of responsibility when you were creating the character of rocket and indeed of jamal and you know the other characters in the book as well do you know the thing is it wasn't um i wouldn't i wouldn't describe it as a responsibility you know, because it was just, it just, it was just kind of natural, if it makes any sense. It's just like, yeah, I'm yeah. designing these characters and they, you know, they're representing children that aren't seen, you know, front and center that often in this industry that I'm in. And it was just important. Like, it really was a, a point of importance for me to get it right. And it wasn't difficult for me to get it right because these kids are me if that makes any sense. So it just wasn't difficult. So I guess maybe that's why I didn't find it to be a challenge, if that makes any sense. It was just a case of drawing children that, you know, looked like children that looked like me as a child and other children I knew as a child as well. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it it was, it's like Nathan said, it's this tricky thing where it wasn't intentional, but it was important, Mm. but it just, it just wasn't the, um, the, 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 the overall kind of thing because again we weren't setting out to do um this black centric book you know it was a book about a girl who just happens to be black but she mm. life so yeah it was important i mean i guess i guess it was important that we we didn't get it wrong let's put it that way you know i guess it was yeah. important that we didn't get it wrong but we weren't putting this big old emphasis on this mission to get it right but it was yeah. just important that we didn't get it wrong like that's all it was you know that, that's enough pressure, I think, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yourself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, it's really interesting that you mentioned, you both mentioned Roald Dahl and obviously the formative reads for so many children. Um, they they are quite, I suppose, old, old fashioned, given that the time that they were written in and, mm. and certainly very sort of middle class and white on the mm. whole. But there's, is there something about the universality of those stories and also that fantastical element, which means that you could very easily read a lot of those stories and not think about 
what the character necessarily looks like yeah. and you can definitely you could probably put yourself into those books as you're reading them was that the case for either of you it was for me yeah like it it definitely was for me as you know as i said um previously escape was like a big deal to me when i was younger like i was looking for anything that would take me out of my current you know um environment and mm. into a world where i could dream a bit bigger so escape was a huge thing for me and you know books like george's Mar marvelous medicine which is one of my favorite doll books um they just allowed me to 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 to, to look at the environment that i was in because George's Marvelous Medicine isn't a, is a house. It's him and his grandma in a house, right? Like, it allowed mm -hmm. me to look at the environment I was in and just think about it in a fantastical way. Um, it, it created a yearning for adventure. And I never, at the time, looked at it as, this is something that's not accessible to me because George doesn't look like me. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a thing at the time. I mean, it was weird because... Um, I guess, I guess for me, the importance in, t in terms of representation is like, it is important for children to see themselves as, um, you know, see themselves, see direct reflections of themselves at the time. But what's even a little bit more important for me is that they get to see a potential of what they could be as adults, right? Yeah. And, you know, for me, that's why at the time when I was younger, I didn't appreciate the lack of representation. I didn't appreciate it at all. I was just looking at it like, you know, George is this kid that's going through hard times. I was a kid that was going through hard times. I could relate on that level, right? Mm. But then as an adult, there was this tricky space I was in in my 20s where I just didn't have a clue, you know, as to what was possible. For example, the job I'm doing now, I could only have dreamt of doing that job when I was younger. And it's such a straightforward job. I'm an illustrator. It's not the, it's, I'm not a rocket scientist. You know what I mean? I'm, a, I'm an illustrator. Like, so I should have been able to imagine myself as an illustrator at a younger age, you know, but I just never, I didn't see that anywhere. I didn't see that anywhere. So I think that for me is, 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 um, is the kind of, that kind of explains the extent of my relationship with this whole representation thing. It's like, it's important for kids yeah. to see themselves at both ends of the spectrum as kids and as adults in these books that we create, you know? Well, one can only hope that Dapo, you will now act as that, that beacon for, for young kids to sort of see, that as a, as a possibility to see illustration uh, work as something that they might be able to do. As you say, if you don't see it, you can't imagine yourself doing it, right? So it's it's, it's, so it's infinitely it harder for you to imagine yourself doing it. Yeah. Like, Cause I got there in the end, right? But like, it's just, it took a little longer than it probably would have done had I been able to see examples of it just, you know, just normally and regularly. And uh, Nathan, for you, I mean, you, you're a, you're a multi-skilled individual, so you're writing, you're acting, you're screenwriting, you're doing all sorts of mm. creative things. You know, did, did you, uh, was it, what was it that gave you, I suppose, the support and the confidence to know that you could do those things? Was it a question of seeing other people doing it or were you lucky to have support in other ways? Yeah, I mean, I've always uh, had support in other ways. Yeah, my parents are, have always been pretty incredible like that when, you know, when I, left school I got a place at uni and I was like I'm not going <laughs> I'm not going I'm gonna and I had a like a not a, a non-paid acting job they it was like do this non-paid acting job at the Lyric Hammersmith or go to uni and I was telling my parents yeah I'm gonna go and do this non-paid acting job of course at first they must have been like oh my god but <laughs> um throughout all of this they've always very much been like yeah do it see how far you can run with this you know what I mean and so far it's been so good but again um i've also i also see you know other black people in in the media like lenny henry i like reggie yates like luella gideon and you know just all those people there who have kind of either supported me literally or i've seen in those positions and been like well i know they can do it so i can do it doesn't mean it's mm. easy but there's lots of i i always look at I always do my research to find black people who have done it before and they are very inspiring. Listen, both of you, it's so brilliant to speak to you about this book, um, about Rocket as a character, about where sort of, I suppose, where children's publishing is. I, I'm hopeful for its future because of people like you creating the books that you have mm -hmm. and winning prizes and, and showing other people that it's possible. And I just wonder whether you have a similar optimism about what children's publishing can achieve in the future. Yeah, I think, 
look, I, I am I am of optimistic nature. That is how I am. I have to be like that. Otherwise, you know, we're 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 currently recording this in a pandemic. So if I wasn't, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, and obviously, like you only like, and I, you know, I'll just firstly on that uh, element, I will shout out Daps. You know, he's been in this industry for what a few years, and even the amount of change he has generated solely himself. You only have to follow his Twitter and Instagram to see how he has stepped into this industry and is making immediate change. Like I, 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 so, you know, with people like Daps in the industry alone, I can only tell you the industry doesn't have a choice. It's <laughs> He's not going to not accept it. And he's, he's making change from, from, I don't want to say the like grassroots from grassroots. He's finding yeah. other illustrators and bringing them in. Like I could, you know what I mean? I don't want to, yeah, but long story short, with people like that <laughs> in the industry, things will change. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit speechless right now. Um, <laughs> no, thanks, man. Look, no honestly, thank you so much. I mean, the, the thing for me was, it's, it's a weird thing. Coming into this industry at the age I came into this industry as well, I was 35 when we signed our, our book deal. So I think there was a certain level of maturity that was afforded to me because of that age that allowed me to kind of really see clearly how I could impact things and how I could help change things and move things along and what needed to be changed, right? Because um, I don't know if you know the stats, they're changing now. I was at the mm. time one of maybe two black British illustrators working in children's books at the time. And the gap between myself and the guy who came before me was something like 32 years mm. in, in when he started in the industry and when I arrived. Obviously it was a different time back then, but it was still no excuse for the fact that the change hadn't happened change that needed to happen hadn't happened so my first sort of year in the in in, in the industry mind you this was before i was published um i was just in the industry but everyone knew i was coming but nobody knew nobody had seen a book from me yet so like my first sort of year in the industry it was tricky because every time i walked into a room i was the only one that looked like me and where that's not a big deal you know straight away after the first 50 rooms or so it starts to become a thing, right? Mm. So my first thing I did was just to sort of look around and ask openly. I asked on Twitter, I was like, where are the other Black British illustrators in this industry? And then it turned out that, again, that's when I found out the stat that it was just myself mm. and one other person. And then it just became this thing where I wanted to sort of find the talent um, that was in the UK because the thing that we get told a lot is the talent's just not there. It's just not there. It's just not there. And it's a lie. It is there. You know, it's just... The publishing industry is used to the talent coming to them. They're mm-hmm. not used to having to go out to find the talent, which was the reason, again, at the time, why I was flooded with offers. Because here I am, you know, this one black guy who can draw. And I was just flooded with book offers. And I was like, wait, this 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 feels good right now, but there's something odd here, you know. Mm. Um, but once we figured out the stat, it was just a simple case of finding the talent and letting them know that, you know what, this is possible. You are welcome here. And that has been almost like my second job off 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 the off the page to kind of just show people that this thing is possible to find the talent to bring them in to show them to demystify the industry because there's a lot yeah. of mysticism around the industry around access there's so yeah. much mysticism so much unnecessary mysticism so that's my my thing that's the best way to sum it up my 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 driving goal whether it be with the stories I'm telling or the activities I'm doing off page is to demystify this industry and make it accessible and open to all. The pandemic, of course, prevents us from being together in person and raising a glass to your success. So it'll be metaphorical for the moment, both of you. But I hope that you know when, when things have eased up a little bit in the very near future, we'll get a chance to meet and to to toast your success. But for the for the you know for the moment now, Dapo and Nathan, it's been a great pleasure to speak to you both, and a huge congratulations once again for Look Up. No, thank you. Cheers, buddy. Um, Cheers. Thank you so much. As well, big up all the nominees because yeah, you know, seriously, Sharna. Um, yeah. Yeah, all of all the nominees, all the other winners as well. You know, um, I think by the time this goes out, I can say this. So congratulations to Shana as well, I'm guessing. 
you can yeah. definitely say congratulations. Yeah, She'll be, absolutely. in fact, by the magic of technology, she will be appearing after a short intermission to talk to me about her experiences <laughs> as a writer yeah, too. Congrats. <laughs> right, massive congratulations to Shana. So, so, so proud of her, man. She worked so hard on that book. Shout out to the whole Nightsoft team as well. Yeah. Those guys are doing amazing, amazing things in this industry. Um, yeah, honoured, honoured. That's the word, man. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank honored. you so much. So this is the short intermission mentioned, allowing us to segue neatly into part two, where I'm joined by Shana Jackson and Liz Hyder to talk about two very different books and the many influences that help their authors to become both readers and writers. Shana and Liz, uh, welcome to the Waterstones podcast and massive congratulations from all of us at Waterstones on your fantastic victories. Thank you so much. And obviously congratulations to Liz and to Dapo and Nathan. It's amazing. I'm so chuffed. In the first part of this podcast, I've spoken to Nathan and Dapo about their success um, and I suppose the significance of what they've achieved, because I think there's something amazing about an illustrated book with a black female central character. And in, in particular, we spoke about how young kids could see themselves in that book and even get dressed up as Rocket for World Book Day and what an amazing difference that made. And I suppose, Shana, in a way, you're continuing that work with your own writing. High Rise Mystery places two black sisters uh, at the centre of the action. And I sort of, let's let's talk a little bit about the, the world that you've created there because yeah. you are basing these two sisters there in a sort of urban estate and there's a real sense of the community around these uh, two girls. And that is something which isn't reflected so often, I suppose, in uh, books for younger readers. And I think particularly in the sort of literary uh, whodunit genre, which always seems to be far more white and middle class. Tell us a little bit about creating the Tri Estate and, and the world for, for those two sisters. Yeah, so yeah, High Rose Mystery is two young sisters, Nick and Norva, who live on this the estate called the Tri, which was built in like the... It's a modernist building, so built in the 60s, and they follow their noses um, and their intuition to the bins where they find their dun 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 art teacher <laughs> in the bins, and they have to quickly solve that crime because it looks like someone close to home may be brought into the frame. And it, yeah, you, for those reasons you talked about, were absolutely important to me. I loved mystery growing up. Loved it, loved it. And my mum and I used to read and watch Sherlock Holmes and Poirot and Agatha Christie books and other ones. And it was it was fantastic. And then I was thinking, you know what, wouldn't it be interesting if we had a murder mystery, which wasn't, you know, Art Deco-esque um, and, and posh and very white and set it now in a tower block. And it was kind of like a, a thought experiment and seeing what would happen and then taking it from there. And for me, yeah, I really wanted to show that life in in a tower block is not necessarily all doom and gloom or a negative experience. And in fact, that the people who live there really come together to support each other and have, you know, lovely times too. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So it was interesting there taking the like codes and conventions of, of mystery of the traditional conventional mysteries and then, and then transposing them to this new period. So it was fun. It was a good experiment for me. And I, I really enjoyed writing it. I'm really glad that, um, People like it as well. It's cool. But people people don't just like it, they love it. And also uh, what you've been able to do is to, to follow up Haro's Mystery with a, the second book, Mic Drop. Yeah. Um, the continuing adventures of, of Nick and Norva. And I, you know, looking at those two characters, two sisters with very, very different personalities, um, where, where did they come from? I, I don't know what your sort of own family background, but that idea of creating sort of, you know, two very distinct people and that sort of familial relationship between two sisters. Yeah, so I don't have a sister. I have two younger brothers and so people are like oh do you have a sister and I'm like no I kind of wish I did I mean like that's no disrespect to my brothers I love them very much but I always <laughs> what it was like to have a sister and and that's the kind of relationship I see and people say oh are you like Nick or are you more like Norva and actually I think I'm a bit of both of them depending on the day <laughs> so, so yeah so I really I don't know. It's been really important to me to show young black girls being smart and funny and clever and like very different from each other and not falling into, you know, stereotypes because it's quite, you know, it can be easy to do that, especially girls mm. who live on an estate in, in South East London. And it was, yeah, really important to show like the kind of the breadth of young blackness in the capital. Mm. Now, Liz, your book, Bear Mouth, takes us somewhere completely different. So we've been talking about a sort of a very recognisable urban landscape. And Bear Mouth takes us, 
underground. It takes us to a coal mine. Uh, and the book has a sort of fable-like quality. So it, it's not sort of set in, I, I suppose, in any particular time, but you get a real sense of, you've spoken about your research into the kind of the, the working conditions for Victorian children, mm. but you're creating effectively this sort of place that doesn't really exist. How, how Was it a question of doing huge amounts of research to help you create Bear Mouth? And why was it that you decided to make it more fable-like than sort of very specific in, in location and time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> can I just say this? Because I've been trying to be really quiet, which is really difficult for me. Um, but I, I want you to, I want you because when you said about people really, um, really love Shauna's book, like I love it so much. I want you to put this in. Like I have put so many copies in people's hands and I don't know where my own copy is because I've lent it to someone saying you must read this and now I don't know where it is, which is really annoying. Um, but mic drops literally just come in for me. So um, I, that's going to be my, my reading tonight. So thanks, Sharma. <laughs> you are so nice. Thank you so much. It is, honestly, it's just such a great book. I love the fact that, like, it reads like a classic, but because you've done the twist of sort of setting it now, it feels um, it feels really modern at the same time as it feels like it reads like an, an absolute classic. And it's just so full of twists and turns. So if anyone's listening who hasn't read it, just read it. It's just phenomenal. Like, you will not be able to put it down, and you too will be uh, trying to find your own copy where you've lent it to someone. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, but yeah, bear mouth. Um, yeah, the idea came about because I went, I went down. A, it was actually a slate mine down in um, um, on the North Wales coast, and it just it's such a strange environment. And I don't really, <laughs> I don't really like the dark, and I don't really like small spaces, <laughs> and I don't like being underground. So you know, going down a mine is like a triple whammy for me. Um, but there's something really kind of weirdly beautiful about it, and something very oppressive about it as well. And then I, I guess that like everyone kind of find out a little bit about kind of child minors when you're at school and Victorian child minors, but I'd kind of forgotten about all of that really. And then when you sort of see it in front of you and you start thinking about it and it just made me think about exploitation and it made me think about um, how we're sort of still exploiting people now and children are still working in mines now. It's just that they're not in this country, so we sort of don't see it Um and yeah, it got me angry. So I thought <laughs> I'd write a book about it. Um, <laughs> and my kind of twist is that um, because it's kind of a, a, a very kind of enclosed, uh, oppressive environment down there, my twist is that they live down there as well as work down there. Mm. Um, and no one did because I keep getting asked this with people going, did people really live down the mines? No, uh, not not in Victorian times. Um, there's no record of that. So, but yeah, that was my that was kind of where it came from. I did go down quite a lot of other mines, confronting all my fears, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I read a lot of books about it. But I mean, it's it's interesting. You do kind of run out of you run out of material. There, there's it's surprising that there isn't more really about that kind of time period um but mm. you know obviously the people who work down there a lot of them couldn't read and write so they're not going to be they're not going to have a voice they're not going to be telling their their own story sort of in a way but it's a really fascinating period um and i think it ties into kind of wider conversations that we're beginning to have now um long overdue about about empire and about exploitation and how that all kind of ties in together with kind of the the coal mining industry over here with the cotton mills with um slavery in america and um in the caribbean and i think it's really good that we're having these conversations it's about it's about time really absolutely and you mentioned there some some of the really big themes you're dealing with you also obviously the book is engaging with these ideas about capitalism about organized religion about corrupt governments and also i suppose particularly with the way the book is written because it's it's written in a kind of um not pigeon English, but it's because Newt is is learning from a mentor about how to write and to speak. It's about very much about literacy, and 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 as you say, the people who haven't had a voice being given a voice. Um, literacy and education, obviously, hugely important, and I'm sure you both feel that writing books for children is a is a huge part of that. But for you, Liz, was that was that a really important theme for you to get across in Bearmouth about people getting the chance to tell their own stories through education and literacy? Yeah, definitely. And um, being able to kind of read and write, being able to be eloquent in what you're saying, um, whether you're speaking or whether you're writing, it is a form of power. And if you don't have that, then that power is taken away from you. And I think you see it time and time again in history where 
um, where that power is taken away from people. So it's like one of the one of the things I always wanted to do with Newt was that Newt was learning to read and write um, because it does it does give Newt power, it gives Newt strength, and it gives Newt a, a voice, and then mm. you can use that voice to try and bring about change. Um, so yeah, it's a catalyst really for me. It's a catalyst in the book, but I think it's kind of a, a catalyst more broadly, and that it opens your eyes as well. If you can read and write, you can go to a library, you can pick up books, you can teach yourself another language you can teach yourself skills you can you can learn a whole world of learning through books um and you can't do that if you can't if you can't read absolutely but books are incredibly powerful things and i think obviously most people will have a relationship with books that is shaped by how they're introduced to them um when they're younger uh and some people will always be avid readers from a young age others might come to it much later because they didn't quite get on with it at school um shana if i want to come to you first i just wondered like when did books become a sort of big part of your life and and who were the authors that you you were reading as a child who who shaped your reading and, and maybe even encouraged you to think about writing yourself yeah so i loved reading as a kid and even when i was a toddler my mum used to have like a I remember this like a subscription to like Disney books like little books that were based on Disney films and we had them in this little funny plastic bookshelf and I remember that when we were like when I was about three and then when I could read independently the local library was like a little bike ride away so I'd go there all the time but the book that I really loved when I was growing up was a book called The Runaways by Ruth Thomas and it came out I think in 1988 And it's about two kids who are um, unpopular in their class at school. And they find um, one day they find like a lot of money in in like an abandoned house. And then they um, start buying, buying off their their, their classmates to try and get some popularity. They get like scoped out by the teachers and they end up just running away. And they go to Brighton and they go to Somerset and they have like a really interesting adventure but what's so great about it is not the adventure necessarily but it's the relationship that develops between the two characters who are really different one's a black girl one's a white boy and the the white girl in there Julie Winter she has she's she has literacy issues and she's struggling to read and throughout that book she's teaching herself by reading and and writing and getting help and her her kind of world opens which is just fantastic. And I, I mean, we used to go to the library and I used to take out everything. So it like, I mean, like I would read medical encyclopedias and like, cause I love that, like finding out about like funny diseases and, and like, you know, elephantitis. So I was like intrigued by that for years. And then I would read like point horror books, choose your own adventure books, sweet Valley high books. I'd read everything Judy Bloom like everything that the library had I would like try and take it out and I think I mean I I love that for me um and I feel like if there's something that's interesting to you I mean you being a young reader just read it read anything don't feel you know that's not something that you should be reading just try and read read things that you like graphic novels Mm. all of it it's all great and it's all valid. Excellent advice there, Shana. How about you, Liz? I mean, were, were you always a reader from a very young age? Um, and, and who were the people that you were sort of devouring? Yeah, I'm nodding so hard to, to what Shana's saying. I kind of feel like you might hear my head fall off because I'm just nodding. <laughs> um, I don't know the runaways, so I've just written that down because I am totally going to go and look that up. Um, yeah, same thing, similar to Shana. It's like um, I was lucky. My parents read a lot. My parents read a lot. And I'm the youngest of three, so it's like all the hand-me-downs, <laughs> dungarees to books. Um, <laughs> and my sister's three years older than me, so my sister sort of taught me how to read, basically. Um, she, set up, she set up a little classroom with me and, like, some soft toys <laughs> and then read us the dreadful Peter and Jane, which are just the most awful books when you look back at them. But, you know, they did, they did teach me to read, so I, I kind of I could read before I went to school. Um, thanks to my sister. She didn't have so much luck with the soft toys, I don't think. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like Shana, I like read anything and everything. And I also was fascinated by kind of like Guinness Book of Records, anything like that. So it was spontaneous combustion for me. I had such a fear around the age of about eight that I was just going to spontaneously combust. (laughs) I don't know why. So did I. Spontaneous combustion and sinkholes. (laughs) Um. Sinkholes, I think I only found out about later. So I feel, uh, yeah, I was probably for the best. I just had one massive concern in my life, just <laughs> combustion rather than disappearing down a sinkhole as well. But um, 
Yeah, I kind of read anything and everything. Um, I read a lot of books that I guess would now be, well, are, are classics, are considered classics, just because they're things that kind of people gave to me. So if people gave me a book for my birthday, I would read that book, you know. So mm. um, Dickens or like C.S. Lewis, um, like Narnia I read, um, uh, anything really, that Green Noah, Borrowers, um, Susan Cooper, like the Darkest Rising series, sort of just anything. But for me it was... Um, Michael Rosen, really, he wrote this, he's got a book called um, Quick, Let's Get Out of Here, and I will bang on about that book until the day I die, because I just felt like he'd been spying on me, that this man called Michael Rosen knew what I was up to. There was like a tomboy in it called Lizzie, who was only mates with the boys, and I was like, how does he know about me? <laughs> and the illustrations had this kind of tall, skinny girl with curly hair, which was sort of me at the time. <laughs> Just like, this man's been spying on me. <laughs> it's been such a great pleasure to speak to you both uh, about your books and about the books that sort of got you reading when you were younger. We wish you the best of luck and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much.